Atheist Nomads, episode 141, interview with Ben Radford. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hello, everybody. And since this is going up Thursday, if you listen to it shortly after release, so in those next couple days, and you live in the Puget Sound, um, come see us at Doyle's Public House, 2 p.m., uh, Sunday, April 11, I believe that is. Yes, it is. Oh, 10. Yep. Sunday, April 10, 10. 2 p.m., Doyle's Public House in Tacoma for our first ever uh, recording before a live studio audience. Yeah, that's up on St. Helens. It's a great little spot. Amazing food, good on taps, good prices. We're going to be in the back in this little room called the Snug. Awesome. So, yeah, come on down, guys. Not only will it be our first time recording before a live audience, it will be our only our second time recording in the same place, let alone the same time zone. This is a true. So that'll be very cool. And uh, let's go ahead and get to our guest. Um, we have Ben Radford, professional skeptic and investigator, among many other things. Uh, he's been on ba- basically every news outlet. He's written a bunch of books. Um, his is a name that floats around the skeptic community like few others. So, Ben, it's a, it's a real honor to have you on Atheist Nomads. Well, thank you. Glad, glad to be on. It's, uh, it, it's, I've heard about you guys, and I'm looking forward to talking to you guys. Oh, very nice. Yeah, we had, we had a, a little bit of a problem here for a while. Uh, hell of a windstorm, I heard. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm out in, uh, in uh, rustic rural Albuquerque, New Mexico, sort of on the edge of the desert. And uh, we've had some, some winds kicking up, especially the last couple of days, and especially this afternoon, it was getting pretty brutal. So my, uh, my power went out for, uh, for almost an hour or so, and uh, luckily oh, it came man. on just in time. for. Uh, I remember I lived in Buffalo for a decade, and it was the sort of same sort of thing where – uh, it wasn't the wind; it was it was the snow. And you would think that in a place like Buffalo, <laughs> you know, like they'd be like, "Yeah, whatever." But sure enough, I would say <laughs> not all the time. I'd say like one out of five times, you know, the power goes out. You're like, "Oh, what? D- did a car hit a pole?" It's like, "No, it snowed." So <laughs> you think I'd be used to it now? Well, so this you know, is, oh, it, it, you know, you're talking about Albuquerque. You know, at least you're not in Taos with those people. <laughs> Anyway, they're a whole, uh, the, yeah, the, the, Taos and Santa Fe are a whole, whole different cup of beans out there. And, of course, yeah. it is nice to have uh, somebody else who's in uh, Mountain Time Zone on the show. That doesn't happen very often. Yes. That is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So. Quite, uh, quite the wasteland. Ben, what is your, your story? How did you get started doing uh, investigations? Well, basically, you know, I um, when I was growing up, like most kids and most teenager, I, teenagers, I was interested in, in unusual things, right? So we, at the time, I don't know how old you guys are, but uh, I'm in my mid forties, and for me, the uh, the seminal uh, TV shows were like things like That's Incredible and In Search of, and uh, and to some degree, Real People and things like that, and so. There were these TV shows. Of course, it's nothing like we would later see decades later with the uh, the proliferation of of cable TV, of course. But at the time, uh, there were all these TV shows and all these you know magazines and books about mysteries and the Bermuda Triangle and UFOs and all these sorts of things. And and I'd be like, yeah, that's really cool. You know, I'd see these things. And and you know, I, I grew up in in uh, in a small town not far from where I am right now, actually, uh, in New Mexico. And and you know, it seemed like all these mysteries, all these weird things, were they were a world away. You know, they were in they were in London dungeons, and they were in the in Bermuda Triangle, and they were in Russia, and and all these all these mysterious, unexplainable phenomena. They all seemed to be you know so far from my everyday life, and uh, so I, I would go to the the bookstore uh, near where I lived, and I would uh, you know, take my allowance money and plunk down you know, five or 10 bucks to buy a bunch of used books. And uh, I would take them home, you know, a big old armful of books. And I was a voracious reader. 
And I would read these and I'm like, oh, this is so cool. Here's this book on, on psychics and here's this book on Bigfoot and here's this book on this and that and the other. And I was reading them and I was really into them for, for a few summers. And then finally I said, well, you know, I, I'm reading about these stories and I see these things on TV. But, you know, even even at that point, you know, I'm talking I was maybe 12, 13, 14. I was like, you know, I'm not seeing the investigation. It seemed like most of the books that I was seeing and most of the TV uh, TV shows and all that. I mean, even then, I had this sort of budding skepticism, hmm. and I said, "Well, you know, well, hold on here. You know, who's who? Who says that? I, I want to know. <laughs> don't just tell me. Don't tell me they say. You know, well, they say a Bigfoot. No, hold on, bullshit. Who is they? Give me the give me the phone number of they, and I want to <laughs> talk to they and find out exactly what they said and exactly what they saw and look at their photos." And so basically, you know, I sort of uh, over the over a few years, I, I sort of got, got disillusioned with a lot of the the, the so the sort of, got, you know, pro paranormal mystery mongering books and all that, just because, you know, there was so precious little investigation. It was, you know, I'm reading all these books and like, well, you know, their name is on a book. I mean, it's it's printed. It must be true. Right. I mean, I'm thinking like, oh, you know, and then I was like, well, hold on here. Right. You know, and it, it just seemed like. Most of the material out there was it was just so stories, you know, it was they, they were just expecting us to believe based on their say so. And I'm like, no, I, I want to know that, you know, I and, you know, I, I don't know if, if Bigfoot exists or ghosts exist or chupacabras or gods or miracles or not. Um, but I'm willing to look at it and, and investigate and I want evidence. Uh, you know, if you just if you're going to if you're going to tell me that X is true. Whatever X is, whether it's you know that you know this is a, a this used car is was driven you know only on Sundays by a, a widow or uh, or whatever the hell you're going to tell me, uh, I you know I if you, if if you expect me to give you my belief, then in return I expect evidence, and that's that's mm-hmm. basically where I come from on it. So I'm curious, were you actually a, a believer for a while in in these things like a Von Daniken, and Chariots of the Gods, or anything like that? You know, I was, you know, um, yes and no. It, that's, you know, that's sort of an interesting question because, you know, at the time, again, we're talking, I was in my early teens and, sure. um, you know, I didn't know any better. And so I would, you know, I would, like many children uh, and, you know, and, and older children, you know, I believe what <laughs> I was told, right? A, an adult tells you something uh, and you're like, okay, well, I don't, you know, this this person is number one taller than me. And clear, of course, anyone taller than you when you're 11 is like, they know something I don't because they're taller than me. And, you know, and they, they, they had this, the whole secret of the sex thing that I know people do, but I don't know what it is. And I, I'm, I'm left out of the club. Right. So <laughs> as, as a kid, there, there's this whole sort of hidden world that, that, you know, where you, we sort of have to take some things on faith. And so, you know, so for a lot of these things, I'll give you an example. I remember, at one point, I bought a book on runes, like Viking runes. And uh, I'm looking through this book, and I'm like, oh, this is interesting. You know, this symbol means this, and this symbol means that. And, you know, and it's it's essentially divination, right? So it's like, it's sort of like, you know, throwing throwing six or stones or tarot cards. And and so I, I was like, all right, well, I wonder if I can do that. And so, um, so uh, a friend of mine, uh, his parents had a, um, a pottery shop, and they make, and, uh, they make you know, cups and bowls and things like that. And I went over there. I said, do you have some extra clay? Like, okay, here you go. And so I got a big old lump of clay, took it back to my house and I flattened it out. And I, 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 um, I left it out in the sun. Of course, here, here in the desert, that doesn't take too long to dry out. And I carved these little, these little runes that I got from the book into these little pieces of, of clay about the size of Scrabble tiles, basically. And okay. with each one, uh, I made each one. I'm like, okay, you know, this is going to tell me my future, right? This is going to be cool. This is, I'm, I'm doing some, I'm on the cutting edge of knowledge, right? I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm touching mysticism, right? I'm, <laughs> I'm about to have access to, to mystical worlds, right? I'm, I'm telling myself, you know, and, so, and w- at one point I was like, okay, well, I need to make it more, more me, right? More, it needs to be personal. And so straight then this is straight out of like, like Tom Sawyer, Mark Twain, right? So I'm like, 
All right. So I, I, it sounds stupid now, right? So I, I, I took a, I took a pin. I, I pricked my finger to get some blood on there, right? So yeah, I'm making a pact with this piece of piece of clay. So sure. I, I put, I, I put a little smear of my blood in these, in these, uh, these runes. I think there are maybe a dozen or so. And I think like I, 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 I tracked down my cat. And I think I took one of her whiskers or something. She was a little pissed about that, but whatever. <laughs> and then, then I put that in. So basically, it was this whole. In retrospect, I mean, you know, now that I have a background in psychology. And now that I've been doing these investigations, I know exactly what I thought I was doing. It is basically the, this whole magical notion of association that you, if you touch something has magical properties and that. But at the time, it was like, oh, my God, you know, this is, you know, this is this is cool. I'm 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 doing something. I'm like telling the future. Right. So I'm doing this. And then so I so I made these runes and they sat out in the sun for a couple of days. And then finally I got up the I'm reading the books. So, OK, now how do I throw them down? And then, you know, and so then I, I cast the runes, uh, you know, basically by, by under me, underneath my treehouse. And um, I'm looking down at them and like, OK, this rune says this. But I'm like, but how do I know that? I mean, it just, you know, I how do I know that I'm interpreting it right the right way? I mean, how how do I know that the, the person that wrote this book on runes and what they mean? How does that person know? Did I mean, who told them? Did, did they make it up? Did they? Was this divinely inspired? Did they read somebody else? You know, I sort of was like, well, hold on here. I mean, uh, I'm in the, I'm, I'm basically, you know, ca- acting as my own psychic here. And I'm like, but uh, how, how do I know? How does this person know? I want, I wanted some anchor to reality, uh, something that would give me some reason to think that, that the, the interpretations uh, and, and, and the things that I were doing were actually meaningful. They actually had some relevance to the outside world. Hmm. Very nice. Nice. Kind of sounds like that you are imbuing these these things with power in a way, and that, that just kind of yeah. uh, kind of uh, ring rings like uh, people won't would never want to wear the sweater of a serial killer or something like that. They think that there's something exactly. imbued from that spirit into the fabric. It, it is. I mean, that, and that's exactly. I mean, it's you know, contact magic, and that's why. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very common in many cultures around the world. And in fact, I mean, a, a sort of a more secular version of that is, um, is autographs. Um, mm-hmm. I personally don't really collect, I have a handful of autographs from, from people that I've met and, you know, usually authors. I, I'm, I'm a writer, of course, and I'm, I'm a huge admirer of many authors. And so to me, you know, I, I don't really, if I'm going to get someone's autograph, it's, it's, it's like on something they personally did. I don't really care so much. Like, Oh, this person signed it. It's like, so what? Right. I think the only, the only autograph that I have of somebody that I never met is probably uh, Sir Edmund Hillary, the explorer. Oh, wow. um, just cause I'm a huge admirer of explorers. But, but you know, the, where I'm going with this is that, is that the, the whole notion of signing something and signing a book is it's essentially sort of a, uh, a, a more modern version of contact magic, right? The idea is that like this person touched this, right? This is, this is their actual signature. This is, and there's something so cool about that is a certain, there's a certain personal, uh, personal specialness to that, 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 you know, you can't, it, it's not, it's not the same, y- even knowing and understanding that it's still cool is what I'm saying. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, so, so, uh, so that's, that's where I'm going with that is that, uh, that, that sort of element that like someone special, uh, you know, had some connection to a, an item, uh, and that, and that, and that, that translates into, you know, something you can actually look at and touch and all that. That's, that's pretty cool. Okay. Uh, were you raised religious? Um, not really. I, um, uh, you know, my, my family and I, we went to church, um, uh, a couple times a year, usually on Easter. Um, and, uh, and that was fine. I mean, it was never a big deal either way. Uh, my, I think both my parents were sort of nominally religious. Um, but they, um, they were, I was very much brought up with the, with the notion that I would, um, I would decide for myself, uh, what was, what was wow. valuable okay. and what was, what was not. And, and so, yeah, I mean, so they, they never really pushed me one way or the other, um, in terms of, you know, either, this is the truth or this is, this is the correct way. Uh, I remember, you know, we had a Bible in the house, um, 
Uh, I think I picked it up a couple times and honestly, it didn't make much sense to me. So I put it back down, uh, you know, in, in my house now. I mean, I've got uh, it, it was funny. I had someone a couple years ago. I had someone uh, who, 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 who was visiting me, doesn't really know me. They visited me and they're in my house and they said, they said, uh, oh, you, you have you have you have the Bible. And I said, I, I do. And then and then she she sort of looked to the left and said, "Oh, you also have uh, the Book of Mormon." I, I said, "I have that too." And and then she then she then she moved one more and she saw the Quran and she was like, "Whoa, <laughs> what is going on here?" And uh, and so it was just it was just funny because I could I could see in her face the delight that she had. You know, she oh here's somebody who's like relating to me. Oh, you know, he he has my book. I'm like, oh, he's got their books too. Oh, well. <laughs> like, yeah, I sure do. So, with your your family being nominally religious, was uh, that Catholic? Um, for the Midwest, I'd figure Catholic sort of, or I mean, Baptist. It, yeah, I mean, m- more Catholic. It, again, we the, the church we went to was Presbyterian, um, mm. and uh, I mean, the, okay. the, the other thing is that my you know I, I had sort of a uh, probably a somewhat unusual upbringing in that. Um, we were very, um, well, worldly sounds kind of uh, ostentatious, but we, we traveled a lot. Um, and I, we traveled pretty extensively throughout Latin America and Africa and, and, and mm. elsewhere. And so, uh, so as a result of that, um, I grew up most of my, most of my childhood hearing other languages, uh, seeing Sikhs. Um, uh, you know, uh, I didn't, I don't think I actually, I don't think I actually sort of got to know any Muslims for many years afterward, but you know, the, 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 it, it wasn't like, it wasn't like I, I had an insular childhood and that everyone around me was Baptist or everyone around me was Jewish. It was like, right. yeah, this friend is this and this friend is that. And that's why in my, in, 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 in later years after that, uh, and to this day, it, it baffles me why people get upset about other religions. I mean, if you, if you, you know, if the guy down the road is Hindu or Muslim, I'm like, why in the world would I care? I was like, so like if you, I, 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 I honestly don't understand. Like if you're, if you, and I've, I've actually, asked, I've, um, I've asked people like, I don't, I don't really get this. Like, you know, when people are upset, oh, there's a Muslim down the road or there's a, there's a black down the road. I'm like, why do you care? I, I, I don't get it. It's like, do you? Do you not have enough going on in your own life? What? Why in the? Um, I mean, unless unless you know they're, they're pounding on your door, or they're doing something. Unless they're they're actively offending someone else, or they're causing problems. Uh, you know what? What the guy down the street believes is absolutely of no concern whatsoever to me. Well, come on. I mean, how how can they even consider a world where like their truth isn't everybody else's truth? <laughs> it, exa- I just you know I. I, I, I've, I've, I just, I just don't get it. I just, you know, my, I have enough trouble, you know, you know, keeping my own life on track and figure out what my beliefs are. I don't have time or interest in worrying about what other people believe. Uh, I don't care if, if the guy down the street is, is Jewish or Hindu or atheist, or I don't, I don't care. It's, it's, it is, it is of no consequence to me whatsoever. And I, I, the, I mean, I, 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 I honestly just can't comprehend the, the the issue with that unless, unless of course it's within the context of the whole notion of you know thou shalt not have any gods before me uh, as you know many religions i mean part of their premise is we have the one true faith and anyone else is anyone who believes otherwise is misguided or <laughs> satanic or an asshole whatever else mm-hmm. and so but if you if you don't begin with that premise if you don't accept the premise that other people have to believe like I do, then what does it matter? Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to take our, we'll take our first break and then we'll be right back. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash atheist nomads i heard that there's just tons of amazing and funny little anecdotes about the mormons do you know any of yourself 
Um, yeah, I, I have a couple uh, strange moments. I think my favorite, uh, my favorite encounter was, um, uh, there, there, there's, there's two, but the, the main one that, that I always think about was, uh, it was about, excuse me, about four, I'm, I'm, I'm having an IPA. So <laughs> okay, excuse, hold on a second. <laughs> Oh no! By all there means, we go. Um, uh, so yeah, so I was. Um, this happened about four or five years ago. I was in uh, Salt Lake City, and I was coming back uh, from somewhere. I wasn't in Salt Lake City. I was, I think, was flying back from L.A. or somewhere. And um, I was sitting there waiting for my plane con- to come back here to Albuquerque, and um, and just sitting there minding my own business. I think reading a magazine or something. And and in the waiting room there. There were, I think, six or seven Mormons. Um, and, of course, they were, you know, dressed up as Mormons do. And uh, to my right was a, uh, a Mormon uh, woman, a rather attractive one, I, I, I have to say. Um, and, uh, you know, blonde and cute and, and all that. And so, I, I w- again, I, was, I just was pretty much ignoring them, wasn't really paying much attention. But at some point, she, um, she struck up a conversation with me. And uh, I could I could tell almost from the first minute, the, the, you know, where this is going. Right. I mean, I was like, all right. All right. I'm about, I'm about to get the pitch. And uh, so it was interesting because because um, the other women were watching her. So, again, they were there were we're, we're, were sitting there and there were uh, there were, I think, five Mormons who were across the aisle from me, about maybe six or seven feet away facing us. And then there were uh, there was her to my right and there was one or two others to her right. And so uh, she she says, "Hello, oh, you know, how are you doing?" I'm like, "Fine." <laughs> I'm like, oh god. It's like, um, it's like, uh, oh, so are you are you um, are you are you from Salt Lake City? It's like, no, I'm just I'm just coming in. I'm I'm heading home right now. And she says, uh, "Oh, we're 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 from Latter Day Saints." I said, "Yeah, I I, I can tell. I could, the the whole elder thing. I I, I get that. <laughs> I wasn't being rude. I just yeah, I I, I get it." So she says, yeah. And so, you know, again, I was, I was, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was just being polite and like, all right, whatever. And she says, yeah, we're, uh, we're going out to Los Angeles. Hmm. And I said, oh, is there a shortage of Mormons in, in LA? And she says, no, no, no. Um, we just, uh, we, we have a chapter out there and we're, we're going out there where they, you know, we go on the, the different missions. I said, okay. And, you know, again, sort of politely waiting for her to, to get on with it so I can get back to my magazine. And then she says, um, she says, uh, she says, oh, uh, do you do you know much about Mormons? And I said, actually, I I I, um, I I do know a little bit about Mormonism. Yeah, I I, I do. And this sort of, you know, she's like, oh. And uh, she said, uh, have you um, have you read the Book of Mormon? And I said, um, I said, well, I've, I've read through it. I mean, I have some idea of the content. She says, and what what do you think about it? So at that point, uh, again, I'm, I'm sort of, I can see the eyes. I can see the other ones watching this conversation, watching how she's going to, she's going to convert this, this, this heathen here. So I, I, I folded my, the, the magazine in my lap and I, I politely turned to her and said, well, actually, since you asked, um, and I raised my voice just slightly, I said, I, uh, since you asked my opinions on, on Mormons, I, I don't actually share your beliefs. I, 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 I disagree with many of them. Uh, for example, I don't happen to think that black people are inferior because of the color of their skin. Um, I know you do, and you know that's that's your you you can do that. I I'm not I'm not racist in that way. <laughs> she, oh wow! And she, she's like she's like she's like she's like we don't believe that. Uh, so I said, "Have you read the Book of Mormon?" And um, and she she says, uh, and so I mean, again, I was I was trying to be you know polite, and I said I said we can talk about this if you'd like. Uh, we can talk about the mark of Cain, and you know how, how God, you know, you know, cast cast the mark of Cain on the people because of their wickedness, and this is why uh, blacks are, are are cursed people, and and um, and she, so all of a sudden this, this this whole conversation is not going the way that she wanted it to, right? And the other ones are sort of squirming in their seats as they're watching this, and she's like, "Oh, we we don't we don't believe that." I said. That's that's not what the Book of Mormon says. She says, "Well, you know." Um, so I said, "How many how many blacks do you have in in your in your church there?" She says, "We have we have Hispanics." Um, <laughs> so at that point, I'm like, "Oh well, good save there. We we have a Gonzalez and Ramirez. So what do you want from us, right?" So 
at that at that point, I and I said, look, you know, I'm not I'm not going to try to convert you. Whatever. I'm just saying I personally don't share your belief that black people are inferior. Um, and that's you know I. Uh, you can you can believe whatever you want to. It's a free country. I don't share your beliefs, and since you asked what I you know, what I think about more, and we can go into other things about you know the the angel and Joseph Smith, and you know and how many wives he had, and how young they were. I mean, we can we can talk about this if you want to. And she's like, "Oh, I think we're okay." <laughs> so that was um, they didn't talk to me <laughs> after that. I was uh, <laughs> it was just it, it was a very stony silence the remaining fifty minutes before their flight clean. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, man. My uh, best Mormon experience was, yeah, and I, I live in, in Idaho now, but at the time I was I was living in Washington, and I was uh, down in, in Salt Lake on a business trip, and I had a, a day off in the middle of the week, so I decided I'd, I'd check out the uh, the temple. And so I got the, the tour of the temple compound, not allowed in the temple, of course, because, uh, you know, heathens aren't allowed in there. Right. And right, you could you, 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 your your presence might everything might go up in flames. Yep, yeah, might desecrate the the the, the sacred <laughs> building. And so I, I walked into the visitor yes. center, and almost immediately, this uh, older woman assigned me some some missionaries to give me the tour. Two absolutely gorgeous young women. Um, one was from uh, Sweden, and the other one was from I think New York. <laughs> oh man. It was they, a nice tour, are, they, of course. I have to say, they are a... <laughs> yes. <laughs> See, all I get is, like, Mormon elders, the the young, like, 18, 19-year-old boys that come to my door. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, um, at least I hope they're over 18, because the last time I had a couple missionaries knock on my door, I was like, you know, I really have places to go. I was about to hop in the shower. I got to get, like, okay, okay, and I kept talking. And so after a couple of minutes, I just started slowly undressing because I have to get in the shower and go places. So, <laughs> yeah, I got you I got were a, warned. So, mm-hmm. yeah, they, they do have I, to be over. <laughs> I think it's 19 is the current rule. It used to okay, be 20 right. or 21, but they, they lowered it so that uh, men could get married a little bit younger. Because <laughs> you're supposed to be nice. get uh, go on your mission before you get married, and the whole women going on mission is a, a new thing. So it, it tends to be um, not the door to door stuff. It's more like you know being tour guides of the temple, right? <laughs> right. They they make claim to not be racist anymore, but there's plenty of sexism still going on for sure. Oh sure. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I, I give I give them credit for uh, for at some point, uh, 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 if I'm not mistaken, uh, at some point God changed his mind on blacks. So if, if mm-hmm. that, like, oh, you know what? I was thinking about that, and you know, I I guess I'm okay with that. You know, that whole Mark of Cain oh, that was like a joke. It was like, come on, you didn't take it seriously, really? No, no, no. The black dudes are fine. Bring them on. Yeah, I, I love how that like all that changed in about 1975 right like it's like oh yeah, yeah. And, and and look my my position is like look i mean i give credit where credit is to me a lot of religions uh won't change at all they don't yeah. i mean that's you know they're, they're they're so stuck in scripture um that they're like you know this is the word of god blah 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 so i i give them a, a little a little smidgen of credit for actually trying to come into the come into the 20th century kicking and screaming um, but that that doesn't change the basic fact that that you know one of the premises uh, of your religion, whether it currently is now or not, it absolutely was and demonstrably was racist. Mm-hmm. That's that's not cool with me. I, I, I that's not that that's no that's that's <laughs> no. You, if you if you, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah. And of course, the whole reason they changed that the uh, prophet had it, that revelation was just so they could maintain their tax exempt status, and that's a, a good reason, mm-hmm. but doesn't stand up <laughs> in terms of you know inerrant word of God or anything like that. Hey, come on, that's a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, certainly is. <laughs> At least they didn't try and infiltrate the IRS like Scientology did. That's kind of fucking weird. True. 
That is, that is, uh, I, I've had a, I had a couple run-ins with Scientology, actually. I, I never really talked about it, but I, um, um, I, uh, the, the, the organization I work for the Center for Inquiry, um, as you may or may not know, was among those that was targeted by Scientology, uh, in, I think the, the eighties, uh, mm. 70s and eighties. They, um, they were, they were not happy with the organization I work for, partly because of course we were busy, <laughs> Debunking a lot of their stuff and and and, crit- and subjecting the criticism and uh, of course anyone knows anything about Scientology knows they they do not brook criticism well, um, right? <laughs> but uh, so that's that's one one tangent to it and then another time it was interesting. Um, uh, one of the things that I do is I'm a uh, writer for Discovery News, and about three or four years ago uh, I had written a piece for Discovery News on cults. And um, and it wasn't about cults specifically, but it involved cults. And um, and I mentioned Scientology in the piece. Uh, I didn't mention it as a cult, but it was one of several religions. <laughs> I use the phrase very loosely um, that w- that had been uh, criticized for controlling their members and you know cutting off the you know cutting off the their their access to other people and all those things. And um, and what was interesting, so I was at this time, they no longer do it, but at the time they, they allowed posting so that people could comment, of course. Mm-hmm. And so you would have people, you know, back in, uh, for, and as, as you, as you know, many news organizations have now cut that out just because it was, it was, it wasn't useful. It would, people were just arguing. It was all racist, sexist. It was just a bunch of bullshit. But at the time, this was like a year or two after they're like, Hey, this would be great. Let's let, let's let readers comment on this. And, <laughs> and I also would comment myself. And so at one point, um, so I would actually respond, not being vindictive, just like, you know, I'm as a sort of public service, you know, it's not it's very few writers that will actually comment and respond to readers comments in the post. And I was like willing to do it. And one person uh, wrote in there about um, saying, well, you know, uh, I, I disagree with the thing about Scientology. And I responded uh, with, uh, I said, well, actually you're wrong. And I, and I gave two quick examples, including one of them was, I've forgotten her name off the top of my head, but there was a woman that died in Scientology's care. Um, mm. a, a quick Google search, you'll find it. I've, it's been, years, I've forgotten her name, but there's a, it's a pretty well known case where the Scientologist woman was, was ill. Uh, and they, they, instead of taking her to the doctor, uh, they, they, well, I don't want to say they killed her, but they certainly died while under her care. Mm-hmm. And I posted that. Uh, I posted that. And again, it wasn't accusing anybody. It was just like, you know, I just basically said, you should look into this case. And within about 40 seconds, it disappeared. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> and it, yeah, it was really interesting wow. because I had never, I'd never seen that before. So somebody, and, and this is somebody at Discovery News. I mean, this was not, this was, it's, you know, the comment that I posted could not be deleted by the average person. Okay, this had to be, and I'm not accusing anybody. It, it just was really interesting the way it happened was within 40 seconds of my citing a specific case that, that Scientology was implicated in the death of a woman, it was gone. And that was <laughs> the, the first and only time I'd ever seen that. Um, so that was, that was a little, I was a little, wow. Okay. Well, either, either their lawyers are on it or somebody around the, uh, on the website. I don't know, but it was, it was unusual. Wow. Either. Yeah. Lawyers were on it or somebody was afraid the lawyers would be on it. Holy crap. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's kind of awesome. Wow. All right. Well, let's take our second break. And then uh, when we get back, uh, let's talk about some of the, uh, skeptical investigations you've done we love hearing from our listeners you can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com tweet us at atheistnomads send us a message on our facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads or better yet call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666 we might even play it on the show you can also help us out by leaving us a review on itunes stitcher or your podcast directory of choice I've always enjoyed all of your your work that you did on the Chupacabra, uh, especially because it tied into mm-hmm. Species, which is a movie that uh, I almost saw most of it in a the theater. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so I will not talk about that that uh, very fun incident. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, tell us about the Chupacabra because I I just 
like the way that just kind of wraps up in a neat little bow. Yeah, thanks. I mean, that's actually it's uh, the Chupacabra story is um, it's it's probably the the case that I'm best known for. Uh, I've done dozen, um, probably hundreds of investigations of various types over the last 15, 16 years, everything from lake monsters to crop circles, miracles, ghosts, uh, urban legends, uh, you know, stigmata, just, you know, t- take your pick. I mean, pretty much any any subject of the so-called mysterious or paranormal that that's, uh, that's come up, I've probably done some firsthand investigations on or at least some research on. Uh, but the Chupacabra is, um, it's again, it's probably my, my best known case. And um, it's one of the ones I'm, I'm most proud of, partly because uh, it, it, it is and was so well known. Um, you know, a lot of the mysteries that I investigate, they sort of, um, they're not nearly as high, high profile as the Chupacabra story. Uh, you know, there, there may be a particular UFO video, or a particular ghost video, or a particular, you know, lake monster sighting or poor river else. But in the case of the Chupacabra, um, it is, it's so well known. It's probably the world's second best known monster after Bigfoot, maybe time mm-hmm. the Loch Ness monster. Yeah. Um, and, and yet when I, when I began researching it, there was little or no research on it. Uh, it was, and the, this is, this is sort of a running theme with, with my work and my books is that I'm, I'm curious. I'm just in, I'm just curious. I'm, I, I'm fascinated by the world. I'm, I'm just fascinated by the way the world works and the way that people think and the way that people act and what people perceive and, you know, monsters and ghosts. I mean, I just, I just think it's so cool. I'm, I'm, I'm endlessly fascinated and, and amazed by the world. Um, and I, I just, I just think it's cool. And so, so, you know, I, there's so many interesting mysteries and uh, out there to solve. And so, but this one was was a high enough profile that I was actually surprised that nobody had done it before. And and over and over again, you know, when I do these books investigations, I want to do something new. You know, mm-hmm. I, I don't want to I don't want to redo something that someone else has done. I don't want to reinvestigate the JFK assassination. I don't want to write another book on the Civil War or on NASCAR. I want to choose a subject that I personally find interesting that I find compelling and intriguing and that I'm going to be willing to put in the time and the effort. in. And, you know, some, some of the cases that I, I mean, look, some investigations I do in a couple hours, some take me a couple days, some take me a couple weeks and some take years. Um, and that was the case with the Chupacabra that took about five years. Oh, wow. Uh, and so, you know, I, I take, I, yeah, I take these subjects seriously. This is not a joke to me. This is not like too silly to, 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 to take seriously. Um, these are interesting subjects. And so, you know, part of the reason that I was able to solve the Chupacabra mystery was that it was a, it was a relatively new mystery, a relatively new phenomena. And it, in that it only dates back to 1995. So, you know, hmm. I would probably never, I don't want to say never say never, but I would, uh, I will probably never write a book on Bigfoot. Partly because it's such a broad topic and so much has already been done on it. There's mm-hmm. there's dozens and dozens of books on Bigfoot. I have many of them on my shelf behind me. Uh, <laughs> I know a lot about Bigfoot and I probably could write a book on Bigfoot. But I would want – I would if I'm going to spend that much time and effort, I want to bring something new to it. Yeah. And uh, – and, 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 and you know, Bigfoot sightings, I mean, there's so many sightings, there's so many tracks, there's so many hoaxes, there's so many reports. It's just too big. There's no way that I could – I mean, I could do it. It would take me 15 years and, and who the hell would read it after all that. <laughs> so yeah, so the, 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 the Chupacabra was – it was a solvable mystery in that there was a finite amount of information I had to sift through, right? There was only mm-hmm. – again, it only dates back to 1995. So, you know, I didn't have – hundreds and hundreds of reports. I had a few dozen reports. I didn't have hundreds and hundreds of photos. In fact, we don't have any photos. There was, so there was the, by, by establishing the parameters to it, I said, okay, you know, I think I can do this. There's, there's only so many sightings. There's only so many witnesses. There's only, only so many angles to it. And so basically I, I was intrigued by it. Uh, partly for one reason was that, um, it's a vampire. I mean, it's, you know, at its heart, the chupacabra, it means goat sucker in Spanish. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a vampire. And, um, and that's, you know, I spend uh, chapter two in my book talking about the chupacabra's place in vampire mythology. Because that's exactly what it is. You can look at, uh, you know, I trace mm. back the origins of the chupacabra. You can look at, for example, the, um, the vampire legends 
in in uh, in late middle Europe, uh, Middle Ages Europe. You know, you've got people who are being dug up uh, and thought to be vampires and staked to the chest and the whole garlic and all these sorts of things. I mean, some of that stuff really happened. And so, in order to understand the the chupacabra in its context, yeah, number one, you have to understand that it's a vampire and it's uniquely a vampire, right? Bigfoot doesn't suck blood. The Loch Ness mm-hmm. Monster doesn't suck blood. The Jersey Devil doesn't suck blood. The Chupacabra does suck blood. That's part of its. That's part mm-hmm. of its. That, that's, <laughs> that's part of what it's aimed to do. And so, well, and, so and with the, number one, I'm like, this is cool. With with Go the ahead. with the, uh, the the blood sucking part, that's that's one of those things. The timing, I think, is really interesting because it would have been the 80s around you know rural parts of you know the uh, inner mountain region in the the U.S. Um, you had. Mm-hmm a lot of reports of uh, cows and, and sheep ending up uh, drained of their blood from satanic rituals. Right. And right. a goat yeah, sucker. That, that, <laughs> well, it, no, it's fascinating. I mean, that's, you know, this is one of the things I, I'm, I talk about in the book is that it's all about the context. And so you have a, like, let's say you had a, 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 a cow or a goat that, uh, that a rancher finds on their ranch in in some rural area that seems to be sucked of blood. It seems to be drained of blood. It's dead. There's no obvious wounds. I mean, it's not cut open. It wasn't shot, uh, and it just seems to have you know it, it, you know, it may have some some markings of you know may, maybe um, something around the neck or maybe like maybe part of it was was cut with so called surgical precision, right? Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> So it, it depends on the context. So if that if that cow had been seen, had been found, for example, in, say, 1978 in northern New Mexico, the the belief would be that it, that was the that was uh, aliens. The, the idea would be that this is mm. clearly a victim of alien cattle mutilation. Some UFO came by. It's like, hey, I want to kill a cow because <clears throat> that's what I do. I came from across the universe to kill cows on earth. And so, <laughs> damn, I'm going to do this one. So, God so th- right. that would be an explanation for that. So on the other hand, um, that exact same dead cow, the exact same body and all the same evidence, if that had been found, say in the Midwest in say 1987, Satanist. it would have been attributed to Satanists. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And so it's, oh, well, yeah, I mean, because they, and, and I've written about that uh, on many occasions about people who claim that some, some dead animal or something was was obviously the work of Satanists, and they always have to explain, like, okay, dial it back. <laughs> All right, take a deep breath. You don't need to worry about Satanists behind every door. So then, so yeah, so th- so in that in that social context, it would be Satanists. And of course, it, had it been twenty years later, say nineteen ninety nine, uh, in Puerto Rico, it would be the chupacabra. So it's 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 all about you know somebody finds something they find unusual or mysterious and the question is what do they think it is it's you know what what is what is in the air in the zeitgeist at the time that makes them that, that gives them a ready explanation for what it is and so that's that's basically what I do with the chupacabra and uh, you know it was fascinating because I, I I I worked in like you know forensics I talked to medical examiners I I looked into folklore and all these different angles into it. Um, so that was, that was one of the things that I really found satisfying about the Chupacabra case was that I, I took a multidisciplinary approach to it and there were all these different angles that I was looking into it and sort of solving each piece of the puzzle. And then at the end, the final question was, uh, was its origin. Like why did it suddenly appear in 1995 in Puerto Rico? And the answer to that, which, which you alluded to earlier was uh, there's a close connection to the movie Species, and that's and that was sort of like like once I had that final piece, and like I just sort of it was like a big jigsaw puzzle, and is like missing <laughs> this piece. And I put it in there, like boom, the, the whole picture is there. I'm like, wow, this is cool. Wow, yeah, that is. See, I've always found that really funny because in my mind, the chupacabra has always been there, like Nessie, like vampires. Mm-hmm. I don't remember a time when it wasn't around. So, yes, that's that's and that's one of the fascinating things that, that that's happened in, in the in the couple of years since my book came out. I think it was like 20, 2011 or something. Anyway, a couple of years ago, and um, twenty eleven, and so since the book came out, uh, the, I would say 
the main criticism that I've heard, well, reaction slash criticism, is I've had people come up to me, and not just a few people, probably a dozen people come up and say, you know, I liked your book. I think you're right about everything except one thing. I know for a fact that Chupacabra was around before 1990s. And they'll say, I know this because I grew up in Texas, and I heard about it in the <laughs> 60s. Or someone else will say, you know, I grew up in New Mexico in the 1980s, and I heard about it. Or I mean, just I, I, over and over again, I would, I would hear these people, and it was fascinating because all of them are, are sure. They're like, I know for a fact I heard about the Chupacabra. And I'm like, okay, well, that's interesting. Um, I'm not saying you're wrong, although I think you are. <laughs> I said, tell you what. Um, <laughs> tell you what. I will offer a reward. And the reward still stands. It's, it's now up to $1,000. Hmm. I've offered a reward for $1,000 if anyone can provide a reference to a vampire Chupacabra that predates the 1990s. So any, like in, in a diary, a journal, a newspaper, a magazine article, any public, it can't be like, you know, grandpa told me, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know your grandpa. He's probably a liar anyway. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's got to be, it's got to be, your grandpa's full of shit and I never met him, right? It's, it has <laughs> to be something that's verifiable. Uh, and, and you, I mean, because I said, look, you know, if, if this is, I mean, it, and it could be I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, then then that's great. I mean, I I want to know. I want to I want to I want to know what the truth is, and I'll, I'll be happy to revise my book. But the fact is that despite uh, a thousand dollar reward, and despite you know me you know contacting several people who've, who've who've told me about that, I said this is really cool. Prove it. I mean, I don't mean it in a, in a rude way, but show me some evidence. You know, if you're telling me this is true, and not a single person in all the years has managed to come up with a, a single published reference to a chupacabra, a vampire. It can't be because there there is such a thing as a chupacabra. There's a, a bird. It's called the chupacabra, hmm. and it's called the chupacabra not because it sucks the blood from the goats, uh, but it's supposed to. But it, uh, according to the legend, the bird sucks milk from goats. So oh, okay. there there is a whippoorwill bird. Which is known as the chupacabra, and I'm sure someone's like, "Oh, here it is, right here." Like, okay, no, that's why I said vampiric has to suck blood. That's <laughs> that's the key to the chupacabra is it sucks blood. So, and it still stands. And so again, it, it's just, but it, that's that's what I find. It, it's basically this giant memory experiment because I have all these people. Uh, but here's the other thing: is that is that I have other people who are just as sure that they never heard it before 1990. Or 1995, I've had people who said, you know, I lived in Chub I, you know, I, I lived in Puerto Rico for the last 20 years, and I never heard the 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 word chupacabra until August of 1995. <laughs> so then the question is, well, hold on, you have two people, one of whom is saying that I'm totally right, and they know that I'm right because they were there. Then I got somebody else who's like, they know that I'm totally wrong, but they can't prove it. <laughs> so it's like, all right, well, there you go. Wow. What was the most compelling, quote, evidence for the Chupacabra? Or was there any? Um, well, no. Yeah, the, 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 the main evidence that was offered, here, here's the interesting thing, is that, um, you know, the, the Chupacabra is actually two different animals. The, the original Chupacabra, and I'm not giving too much away. People can read in the book because there's a lot more to it. But the, the, the very first Chupacabra, was 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 cited in August of 1995 by a woman named Madeline Tolentino. She lives in Puerto Rico. I actually went and interviewed her, and it's it's very clear to me that uh, that she got her idea of what the chupacabra looked like from the movie Species. If you look at the creature sill designed by H.R. Giger in the film, it looks a lot like the chupacabra that she described. It's bipedal, has these sort of alien wraparound eyes, has these spikes up at the back. Uh, it's not identical in every way, but it's very, very similar when you actually compare the features. So she, she, it's it's crystal clear that 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 her original, and she's the very first person that ever saw that. Keep this in mind. It's not like she was number forty-two. She's she's the index case. She's the first person to ever say that she saw something that later became the chupacabra. Hmm, that is and badass that you found page zero. That, yeah, yeah, and and that that was that was one of the sort of my triumphs of the whole book and the investigation was with tracking her down and realizing that that was actually the case. And so, um, and it was funny because later on I had somebody else, uh, a chupacabra believer, who said, "Well, you know, I, I, you know, I think that you like led her to." I, you know, she said, he said, "You know, I think that you you came to the conclusion and you're basically cherry picking the evidence uh, to, uh, to to you know basically you're twisting her words around." 
And I said, well, I could see why you would think that, except that I actually tracked down an interview with, with this woman, Madeline Tolentino, in, in 1996. Uh, this is uh, several months after, well, almost a year after she saw it, where she told somebody else, independent of me, I wasn't even, I didn't even look into this until, until 15 years after that. She told somebody else that the Chupacabra looked like the alien in the movie Species. So it's like, <laughs> I didn't guide her at all. I, I, I dug up the, uh, you know, these are her own words, dude. I mean, it's like, you know, if, if you think she's lying, then you got a problem because you're calling your own witness a liar. So it was an interesting case where like, oh, well, I think that you led her like, OK, really? Did I go back in time and tell her what to say to, to some other Puerto Rican investigator? I don't think so. Um, but so that was, you know, so basically I solved what the original Chupacabra was. And, and that original sort of space alien type creature, that was only cited for about five years uh, for between 90, 1995 and 2000. Uh, and by 2000, essentially nobody, no one ever saw that again. It, it, the the reports of that basically vanished. In its place were these dead dogs and dogs and coyotes and foxes, the the, the canids, mm-hmm. usually afflicted afflicted with sarcoptic mange that had the hair fall out. And so to answer your question, the one of the most compelling parts of the evidence for many people, and to some degree me, until I sort of started looking into it is the dead bodies because there are a handful of, of, of reports of so-called chupacabra victims, typically goats, sometimes chickens, uh, dogs, things like that, sometimes cats, that, um, that were said to have been drained of blood, uh, mm. ostensibly by the chupacabra. The problem is that there's no connection between that and the chupacabra. And when you, when you act, when these, on the rare occasions when these so-called chupacabra victims were actually uh, investigated when, when they actually had autopsies and necropsies done by people who know what they're doing, they found blood in these <laughs> supposedly totally bloodless corpses. And so, so again, it's like when you, you know, the, the key to solving the mystery, as it often is, is you have to tease apart the assumptions. You have to understand what's being claimed and you have to question your assumptions and say, you can't just assume that this is true and build on it. You have to say, before you say this is true, you have to say, is this true? How do we know it's true? And once you know that it's true, then you say, okay, we can use that to build upon it and go from there. But the problem was that, that unfortunately, the people who had who'd done the very minimal Chupacabra research before me had done a half-assed job on it. And they were more interested in mystery mongering and telling a sensational story than actually solving the mystery. <laughs> wow. All right. It is time for our last break. And then uh, we'll be back for the conclusion. If you like this show, consider giving us some financial support. We make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per-episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. One dollar an episode is all we ask. Please, think of the kittens. What's the strangest thing that you have investigated? The strangest thing. Um, hmm, interesting. Uh, you know, they're all sort of weird in their own way. Um, I would say probably um, probably the weirdest one uh, was I investigated. Um, do you know what the Popa Bawa is? No. 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 Right. The Popa Bawa is a, is a skeptic raping bat demon. Um, that haunts Zanzibar in East Africa. And I, I investigated that. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it was, uh, it's like a night terrors again, kind it, of thing. It is sort of like a night terrors thing. Um, Zanzibar is, uh, it's a small Island off the coast of Tanzania. Um, again, in East Africa, um, Freddie Mercury was born there actually <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> a little, little, little tidbit. Um, and, uh, there was this creature, this sort of night terror bat thing. Uh, the, the descriptions varied. Some called it an ogre. Some called it a giant bat. There were different, some people said it was a ghost, but, um, it was said to rape skeptics. Um, now, as you can imagine me being a skeptic, that was uh, some concern to me. Um, mm-hmm. it's like, <laughs> oh, well, okay then. Um, and, uh, part of the, part of the, the, the legend of the Popabawa is that, that is, it's uh, it attacks those who disbelieve in it. 
So, um, <laughs> so and being being the token skeptic, I was you know I was pr- concerned about getting buggered by this giant bat. Uh, you know, whatever you can, you know, buy me a couple of years first. We can talk about it. But this is this is not what was going on. So I, I went to this area and uh, I had done a little bit of research. There was a um, there was a, a destination truth episode by uh, Josh Gates, uh, whose work is very um, hit and miss. <laughs> I just put that politely. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, he did a show on the Popovala, um and I'd seen it before I went to investigate it and. And Gates, um, he got a couple things right. He got a lot of things wrong. But basically, he, he sort of, you know, did this adventure. It's like, oh, I'm going to go, you know, face this thing. By He always tries to work in some sort of pseudo danger bat thing in his shows. <laughs> I'm more interested in solving a mystery myself. And so anyway, um, long story short, I interviewed some people uh, on the island who, who believed in the Popovala um, and uh, tried to get an idea of what it was. My conclusion, and this was published in 14 Times Magazine about probably five, six years ago, uh, made it, it was a cover article, actually a pretty good article. And my conclusion was that the Popovawa is essentially a version of the uh, the jinn, the genies. Uh-huh. Uh, because the uh, Zanzibar is a heavily Muslim uh, mm-hmm. population. And um, and uh, the there's a very strong belief in genies uh, jinn in among Muslims because of course they're they're sort of the equivalent of angels in the, in the in the Bible, uh, and the Quran is full of references to genies and they would do the and we're not talking like Aladdin like you know the the, the whole um, you know the the, the animated uh, one that everybody always thinks of with uh, with uh, who, who did the uh, the voice for it. Uh, uh, Oh, that was Robin Williams. Yes, Robin Williams. Right. So this is these are not the genies we're we're talking of. Um, to make to mix uh, mix metaphors there. Uh, so uh, the the genies that they believe in throughout East Africa and, and other parts of the Muslim world are essentially um, they they believe that they are created and summoned by um, essentially a, a, a magic user, a magician, um, and to to harm enemies. And so the idea is that the the genies are summoned, uh, and they're, for example, if, if you have an enemy who is a business enemy or a, a business rival or a political rival, whatever it is, the genies will go and wreak havoc with them. They may give them a heart attack, or they may start fires. They there's all sorts of really interesting missions that the jinn are said to be sent on, hmm. and um, and I believe uh, based on my research. Uh, and a comparison between the Popo Bawa stories and the jinn in terms of what they're said to be, their nature, and things like that. I believe that the, in much the same way that the Chupacabra is an updated version of the of the, the vampire stories, um, the Popo Bawa is an updated version of, of the jinn uh, stories, uh, sort of for a modern um, for a modern Zanzibar. And what would happen oftentimes is that the the uh, Reports of the the Popabawa would tend to spike prior to elections, and uh, the uh, <laughs> of course. which was interesting. It, of course, right? So it was interesting because uh, Zanzibar it's, it's sort of a semi autonomous um, island, and so there's always there's always elections. There's always different different parties battling for for control of the island. And uh, so what would happen was that the 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 different political leaders would tell the would tell the people. If you don't vote for me, the Popova will attack you. <laughs> uh, oh, so it was wow. actually, yeah, it was a really interesting method of social control. Uh, and and you know, of course, many people believe this because they're they're you know, I mean they're they're devout. They, this is what they believe. And so, if you're told that the Popova will, now now keep in mind, and part of the reason you know people say to me, well, what's what's with the raping thing? Why what why does, why does it have to rape things? Well, the answer is. That in in uh, in Muslim uh, in, in in Islam, of course, uh, homosexuality is is taboo, right? And so, mm-hmm. if you have a creature, a monster that will rape you, if you're a man, that is like the that is like the worst. That is like the ultimate defilement for, to, for many Muslim men. Of course, and and so that's why part of the legend of the Popobawa is is the the idea of male sexual assault because it sort of drives it goes right to the heart of what many Muslims fear and that sort of helps to to perpetuate the the story and of course it also helps to keep up the belief in it because again who does it attack people who don't believe in it so if you say yes I believe in it 
and I don't want it to to attack me. And yes, I'll vote the way you wanted. Then the people who perpetuate the the Obama story, um, again, it's 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 essentially a, a method of political control. And the greatest sin ever is to not believe. Indeed. Wow, that is just spectacular. <laughs> Well, you know, like I mean, you asked what, what one of the strangest ones. That's probably the, one of the strangest cases I've I've investigated, um, and it's it's exotic. And and I love that I've been to Zanzibar several times. I love East Africa. I've written about Africa in 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 May and the, the culture and the folklore and the mythologies and stuff. Uh, so I, it's it's kind of a fun story just because um, you know it has it has so many interesting elements of the the Quran and and magical creatures and, and social control and, and politics. And I don't know. It's just a, it, it's a, it's a fun story. Yeah, for sure. Wow. So real quick, how did you get mixed up in Snopes? Cause that's one of my favorite all time websites. <laughs> mixed up with the Snopes guys. Uh, yeah. yeah, I, among, among, I haven't done it for, for a while, but yeah, I've, I've written several pieces for, for the Snopes website. Uh, you know, I, I've known Barb and, and, um, and Mike for a while, uh, David for a while. Um, uh, Mickelson's the last name is where I got the mic. Um, and you know, at one point they, they had asked me to do a piece on, I think it was the Amityville horror, the, the, ex- the true story behind the exorcist. Oh. And, um, you know, we've been in contact a couple of times because they're sort of, you know, more mainstream debunkers, uh, which is fine. I mean, there's not a problem with that. I, I'm I'm less of a debunker per se. I, I consider myself more an investigator. I just happen to debunk things, but I don't. It's not like my goal is to debunk stuff. I just try and figure things out, and mm-hmm. if it's if something's there, that's fine. If something's not there, that's fine. Um, but I, I had uh, I'd been in touch with uh, the Snopes people for. A, a couple times and they're like, Hey, you know, we don't really have anything on the exorcist story, the Amityville horror story. Can you write it up? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Whatever. So, so I did some, uh, some stuff for them. I think that there's probably, I don't know, four or five or six articles I've written for them on, the, I think the tempers and the brain myth, uh, various urban legends. So there's, there's a fair amount of crossover between what we do and, 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 uh, what they do and what I do. So it's, uh, it's sort of a good symbiotic thing, and but they keep uh, they I I don't know how they find the time, I and mean, they're 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 on top of pretty much anything, and you know half the time when someone posts some bullshit on Facebook or social media, <laughs> I just have to go you know, go to Snopes, cut and paste, like there you go, we're done here. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, <laughs> yep, that's about how it works. That, yeah, that should be in everybody's toolkit. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I wish there was an algorithm on Facebook that would automatically post a like in the suggested reading after you look at something always put a scopes article if there is one about it mm-hmm. oh that'd be nice <laughs> exactly all right so, oh, go ahead uh I, I wanted to get a a quick word on uh what have you been working on lately because i heard there was some animation uh, well, there's a couple things going on. Uh, my most recent project is, um, is a book called bad clowns. Um, it's about evil clowns and mer- mysterious malcontented creatures has been out for, hmm. uh, for a couple weeks now. Yes. Uh, clowns are evil. Okay. <laughs> many people think so. It's interesting. I, I sort of trace back the, the early history of clowns to like the court jesters, the Harlequin, the, the punch and Judy shows, things like that. Then I look at the different clowns in, you know, pop culture, movies books magazines things like that uh it. then i have a i have some sections on real life uh, clowns you know stalker clowns killer clowns i have a chapter on dip clowns those are the um the dunk tank clowns the ones that insult oh. you in the midway like hang hmm. there high and dry high and dry oh is that your wife oh my god you know um <laughs> and then uh i have a i have a section on clown porn if if you uh, if you want to <laughs> Research uh, clown pornography. Um, I have a whole section on that for you pervs out uh, there. Yeah, send those links to me <laughs> on the side. <laughs> to me directly. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's my newest book is Bad Clowns. Um, it's been getting good reviews so far. Uh, uh, and it's it's kind of a nice little sort of change of pace for me. Um, again, it's sort of – it's different than my previous books of Chupacabras and Ghosts and Lake Monsters and this and that. But in a way, it actually fits very much into what I normally do because, as I mentioned before – I'm interested in subjects that are unique. That's something that hasn't been done before. And, uh, and apparently I'm the first person to actually do a whole book on, on bad clowns. 
Um, hmm. When I was writing the book, yeah, I was surprised, to be honest. I, you know, I actually had the idea for the book about 10 years ago. I, I conducted some of the interviews uh, with people in the book. I, I interviewed Ouchie the s and clown. I interviewed the, the filmmakers from Killer Clowns from Outer Space, a bunch of other people. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and it's, it got back burnered. I mean, this was 2006 and meanwhile I was busy doing other stuff. I got a master's degree, um, grad school, a couple other books and it, it got back burnered. And then finally, when I sort of dusted the idea off about two years ago, I was like, well, you know, I, I done all this research on it. Maybe I should just go ahead and try to get it, get it done. So at that point I did some research online. I was like, I was sure that at some point between two, th- between 2006, when I first had the idea and 2015, Surely somebody's done a book on bad clowns, right? All the scary clowns, the Joker, John Wayne Gacy, Krusty. I mean, surely someone's done it. And much to my astonishment, nobody had. Um, and I mean, you know, there, there's a couple books with like, there's a couple little, you know, sort of cutesy, like little, you know, two or three page books, like, you know, cl- you know, scary clown stories or something. But no actual quasi uh, academic book on clowns. And so I'm like, well, shit, I guess I'll do it. So that's, uh, that's, you know, again, it's something that no one had done before. It's something that intrigued me. Uh, so I'd done that. Um, and uh, I don't have any animation projects uh, coming up right away, although I'd, I uh, have written and directed two animated short films. Uh, one of them is called Clicker Clatter. And it's a sort of a, it's a satire of TV news. And you can find it on snagfilms.com, uh, S-N-A-G films.com. You can watch it for free. I think I get a royalty of like a tenth of a cent. So watch it ten times, I'll get a penny. Um, nice. Snag Films, it's called Clicker Clatter. Uh, clicker as in the remote control, clatter as in noise. Um, and it's, a, it's like a three and a half minute animated short film making fun of TV news and, and ads and things like that. And then I did another uh, short film called Sirens um, uh, in, I think, 2007 or so that was um, – uh, I don't think it's available anywhere online, but it's about uh, the mythological sirens. Uh, and uh, uh, it was based on a, a short story that I wrote when I was like 15, and this, this little kid ends up being killed by sirens. <laughs> so it's, it's a heartwarming story for everyone. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. Uh do you have anything else you want to plug? No, I mean, you know, just, um, you know, you can check me out. I'm, I'm on, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Uh, you can find me at discovery news. Um, uh, you know, again, I've written, uh, nine books at this point, uh, chupacabras, <laughs> clowns, mysterious New Mexico. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and I, you know, check, I have a couple YouTube videos out there. I may be doing more soon. So yeah, I'm around and about and, um, and uh, yeah, hope people uh, hope people enjoy the interview and uh, are interested in some of the th- same things I am. All right. Yeah. Well, I'll get links to uh, well Discovery News, Twitter, and I'll uh, hunt down your Facebook and, and YouTube. Put those all in the show notes. Awesome, Ben. It's been a lot of fun. Long yes. time coming. Been a real pleasure. Thanks. It was great talking to you guys. It's been fun. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. The music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads.